today. And you may be seated this morning. Let's get into our Bible lesson today. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 19, Exodus 19, verse 1. And then after that, I'll be going to Hebrews 12, Sister Hurst. Exodus 19, verse 1. <clears throat> today is the privilege of a relationship with God. We have the privilege of a relationship. In the Old Testament, they didn't have that privilege. God showed up some places. Now, in the garden, they did, and they lost that day-to-day -day relationship with God because of sin. But through Jesus Christ, we have been restored to that relationship with God that we so desperately need. And it's not that God needs us. It's that we need God. And it's a shame that sin has so marred humanity that we don't understand we need God. What I mean by that is most folks don't even want God. They don't want what they need. And even worse than that, people who claim to be Christians don't even put God first. But we need God whether we understand. I'd say it like this. We need God more than we can possibly understand we need God. We can't do anything of eternal value without God. Exodus 19 verse 1 the Israelites arrived in the wilderness of Sinai exactly two months after they left Egypt after breaking camp at that place they came to the base of Mount Sinai and set up camp there then Moses climbed the mount to appear before God Mount Sinai the Lord called out to him from the mountain and said give these instructions to the descendants of Jacob the people of Israel you have seen what I did in to the Egyptians, you know how I brought you to myself and carried you on eagle's wings. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, everybody say if. There's always an if with God. If. If you will, God will. If you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the nations of the earth, for all the earth belongs to me. <laughs> what God means right there is I could have picked anyone I wanted to. And if you're baptized in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Ghost, he could have given it to somebody else. You're privileged. If you're fortunate enough to be in a one God church today, you are privileged to have that opportunity. And you will be to me a kingdom of priests my holy nation, he told them, give this message to all the Israelites. Moses returned from the mountain and called together the leaders of the people and told them what the Lord had said. Remember, the Lord said you're going to be a holy, holy nation. That means a separate nation. That means you're not going to be like everybody else. The church's goal is not to become like the world. It's not. That's not the goal of the church at all. We don't even care how the world does church. We're going to try to do it the way the Lord wants it done. I read something this morning that struck a chord with me. I'd rather be in a small church that did it right than a big church that did it wrong. I'm not aiming to be small. I want to be whatever size God wants us to be. But I want to be in the truth. They all responded together, we will certainly do everything the Lord asks of us. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. Notice God always gives you a chance to opt out. But let me tell you, once you opt in, you better not opt out. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a thick cloud so the people themselves can hear me as I speak to you. God's going to speak audibly. Then they will always have confidence in you. Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Then the Lord told Moses, go down and prepare the people for my visit. Purify them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing. Be sure they are ready on the third day for I will come down upon Mount Sinai all the people, as all the people watch. Remember, God's invisible. When he says I'm coming somewhere, he means I'm going to reveal myself somewhere. 
God can't come anywhere or go anywhere because he is everywhere. Set boundary lines that the people may not pass. Wow, ministry sets boundary lines. Warn them, be careful, do not go up on the mountain or even touch its boundaries. Those who do will certainly die. Any people or animals that cross the boundary must be stoned to death or shot with arrows. They must not be t they must not be touched by human hands. The people must stay away from the mountain until they hear one long blast from the ram's horn. That's what we're listening for. Sound of a trumpet. It's going to welcome us home. Then they must gather at the foot of the mountain. So Moses went down to the people. He purified them for worship and had them wash their clothing. He told them, get ready for an important event two days from now. And until then, abstain from all sexual relations. Keep going for me. And one, one, on the morning of the third day, there was a powerful thunder and lightning storm. And a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn. And all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. All Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain shook with a violent earthquake. That's quite an event. As the horn blast, but you know, these people, my goodness, they left Egypt and started complaining. Then they experienced this and left this and started complaining. Don't, don't feel too bad about them, though. I've seen God heal some of us, and we've not show back up for church. I've seen God make a way for people when they were desperate, crying, begging, pleading at the altars. God, please, I promise. And then three months later, they don't come to church anymore. What? As the horn blast grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply for all to hear. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. <clears throat> then the Lord told Moses, go back down and warn the people not to cross the boundaries. They must not come up here to see the Lord for those who do will die. Even the priest who regularly come near to the Lord must purify themselves or I will destroy them. You don't mess with God. But, but Lord, the people cannot come up on the mountain. Moses protested. You already told them not to. You told me to set boundaries around the mountain and to declare it off limits. But the Lord said, go down anyway and bring Aaron back with you. In the meantime, do not let the priest or the people cross the boundaries to come up here. If they do, I will punish them. So Moses went down to the people and told them what the Lord had said. <clears throat> That's verse 25. We'll stop there. Go to Hebrews chapter 12 for me. Hebrews 12, verse 18. That was the Mount Sinai experience of the Old Testament that brought about the law of Moses. And Hebrews has something to say about that. We're going to read Hebrews uh, verse 18 through 29. You have not come to a physical mountain. To a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai when God gave them his laws. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice with a message so terrible that they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command. If even an animal touched the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. No. You have come to Mount Zion. They came to Mount Sinai, but we have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself who is the judge of all people. And you have come to the spirits of the redeemed in heaven who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people. And to the sprinkling of blood which graciously forgives instead of crying out for vengeance as the blood of Abel did. 
See to it that you obey God, the one who is speaking to you. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, how terrible our danger if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. Now, wait a minute. I thought we believed one saved, always saved. Apparently they don't. The Bible don't teach that garbage. I called it garbage on purpose. He said, you better be careful you listen and obey God. If God didn't spare him under Moses, he certainly won't spare you. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that the things on earth will be shaken so that only eternal things will be left. That means if you don't have eternal things in your heart, you're not going to make it. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Finally, for our God is a consuming fire. We have come to Mount Zion. And in the kingdom of God, we are regularly extended the privilege to develop relationships what I, what I would call dynamic people. I have dynamic relationships in my life that I need. Brother Anderson's a dynamic relationship for me. Brother Huspeth is a dynamic relationship for me. There's people who are mentors in my life, and we all better have them. There's also people who call me bishop. Can you believe that? At my young, naive age, I have some people, not here, but I have people outside here that call me bishop, and I just kind of laugh when they do it. But I hope I've mentored something into their life and spoke some truth into their life that can cause them to grow in Christ Jesus. And we are going to need ministry if we're going to make it to heaven. Amen. But the greatest opportunity ever afforded us is the opportunity to have a mentorship from heaven. And that is Jesus Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. The dynamic people God often puts in our lives can help us to grow in the things of God. Matter of fact, that's why the devil does not want you to go to church. He does not want you to be around people that can encourage and help your walk with God. That's why I often tell people when they're struggling living for God, I say, just show up for church every time, all the time. When you feel like it and when you don't, just show up. God's always got something there for you. It might be the word, it might be a brother, it might be a sister, but God's always got something there to help you on your journey. Former Apple CEO, the late Steve Jobs, served as a mentor to Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Former Morehouse College President Dr. Benjamin Mays was an outspoken critic of segregation before the rise of the modern civil rights movement and a mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. May's emphasis on the two ideals in particular, that are one, the dignity of all human life, and two, the incompatibility of American democratic ideals and American social practices. And these things Martin Luther King took under his wing and pushed forward in our world. It came from mentorship. We all better have somebody mentoring us in Christ Jesus. The idea that you're going to make it with you and Jesus along is not a biblical ideal at all. He has given us ministry. He has given us prophets and apostles, evangelists, teachers, evangelists. All these things are to help us to grow in Christ Jesus. The children of Israel received the greatest privilege ever afforded to humanity, the privilege of a relationship with God. But when God comes into a relationship with somebody, you better believe there's an if involved. There's always going to be, if you will, I will. He's going he to love you whether you do or not. But you're not going to have a relationship with, with him without some obedience on our part. Because remember, God does not need us. We need him. He's not privileged to have a relationship with us. He can find somebody else. He's even thought about starting over. 
They were chosen from among all the people groups of the world, given the blueprints for the worship plan of the tabernacle of Almighty God, given the privilege of communication with the Lord God Almighty through prophets and evangelists and ministers during their time, chosen to record the, pr the precious scriptures that we have today and called to be an example to the world of a holy nation before God. The world should look at the church and say, they're different. Even if they mock us, that's okay. I still want them to know we're different. Amen. Because the Bible you read says we're to be a holy nation, a peculiar people. Peculiar means just a little bit odd. We just don't really fit in here. That's all right with us. Our goal is not to try to fit in. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And when Abraham looked for that city, he, he was happy to call himself a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. And because he would call himself that, God said, I'm not afraid to be called his friend. Yet their faith proved weak, these Israelites. It became obvious they squandered the ultimate relationship. I guess the saddest of the saddest of the saddest things that could happen to an individual is to know the truth of this Jesus name way and bust hell wide open. Wow, how sad. The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is twofold. Faith is, number one, what God said, and number two, whether you believe it or not. And if you believe what God said, you will do what God said. Amen. Remember the story of the guy? who was going across, the, this is just a, a story, it's not a true story, but it's a story I heard, the guy going across the tight line over the Grand Canyon, he was walking that wire, the crowd was all yelling and happy and excited, he made it across and he came back across the tight wire and he said, who believes I can do it again? They all hooped and hollered, yes, we believe you can do it again, we saw you do it. He got a wheelbarrow. Who believes I can take the wheelbarrow across this time? They all who, and the guy who was hot on us, he said, see you, sir. You believe I can push this wheelbarrow across that line? Yes, I believe you can do it. Climb in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> oh, I ain't getting in that wheelbarrow. You just said you believed. And bring it down to where we live. You say you're looking for a city whose builder maker is God. Be at church. I can play games with you, but it won't help you get to heaven. Don't make your way out of heaven with excuses. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That's a small level of faith. Number one, you got to believe God exists. Well, I ain't never seen God. I ain't never seen God either. But I've seen everything God's done. I ain't never seen the builder of this house either, but I believe he exists. If somebody come and told me this house done it by, by, fell together by itself through random mutations or random chance, I would laugh in their face. If they looked at me and said, but I've never seen the builder, I'd say, well, I haven't neither. But I believe he exists. <laughs> they want to tell our kids we come from monkeys. They may come from monkeys. If they believe that, they might have come from monkeys. I didn't come from a monkey. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My toenail knows not to grow inside my heart. How does it know that? My eyeball knows not to show up on the back of my knee. There's 
there's information in there. Who put it there? God did. When I look at people, I know there is a God. Well, what about what about the disabled? What about this? What about that? Sin. When God made it, it was perfect. It's not God's fault that all this sin came in. It's our fault that all this sin came in. We need to get back to God and let him clean our house up. Amen. I'm going to preach today if it hair lips the devil. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you're going to come to God, you must believe that he is. And then you must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God don't just reward everybody. The rewards of God follow on the heels of if you will, I will. You're not wasting your time giving to missions. You're not wasting your time being faithful to the house of God. You're not wasting your time praying. You're not wasting your time reading your Bible. If you will seek God, he will reward you. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. By faith, Abraham went looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And if we have faith, we are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. It's going to come down, Revelation said. John saw that city coming down from heaven. Woo! And it's going to come down one day to those who are looking for it. And if we're looking for it, we will be living like we're looking for it. Somebody say praise the Lord. In other words, if we believe it's coming, we're going to climb in the wheelbarrow and say, let's go. Everybody else might be hooping and hollering about it, but I'm going to get in the wheelbarrow. Let's go across. I'm going to trust God to take me over to that city. One must at the very least believe that God exists in order to please God. The same scripture indicates God rewards those who put a diligence into their effort to seek after him. Faith in action is lived out in a positive and trusting obedience from the heart. Faith brings us into a relationship with God and solidifies that relationship. For faith says, God is and he will reward me. Now I will do my part to seek God. The people of Israel demonstrated and immature and weak faith. No sooner had they finished rejoicing over the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea and the decimation of Pharaoh's Egyptian army than they began to murmur and complain against Moses. The point of contention was a belief that Moses and Aaron had taken them into a wilderness simply to die from hunger. They cited that they had sat by meat, had meat aplenty, and bread to full when they were in Egypt. Now you brought us out here to die. The Lord chose to be merciful and sent quail to cover the camp that evening, introduced them to manna each morning. Some gathered quantities beyond the authorized daily serving. And the unauthorized portion began to stink and rot. You see, gathering more than the daily allotment for any, for any other day than the Sabbath day demonstrated an unbelief upon their part. The type of unbelief, this kind of unbelief stinks in the nostrils of God. The people of Israel continue to demonstrate their immature and weak faith by chiding with Moses in Exodus 17. And the Lord demonstrated great patience. As they kept fussing and bickering and fighting. It kept them out of the promised land. When God looks at us with all these promises. In this heavenly kingdom. Let him not find us complaining. And bickering. And fussing over this or fussing over that. or No, thank you God for everything we got. Faith is not permission to be lazy are negligent, are to simply wait on God to do everything. 
nor is faith believing that God is going to thrust us into a lifestyle of luxury and riches. Rather, faith is conducting our lives in a responsible and forthright manner and believing that the Lord will honor our actions of righteousness toward him and God will be honored by our righteousness in this world. Faith does not give us permission to bypass education thinking the Lord will simply make us professional or skilled craftsmen without our effort. That's foolishness. Faith is not foolishness. Faith is always based on the word of God. God said, if you will, I will. God said, raise up your children in the way they should go. Then I will. Now, God is merciful. But don't be so foolish as to think you can skip out on God and not value the kingdom of God, the house of God, the things of God, and somehow in God's mercy you're going to make your children just love all this. Nope, not going to happen. That's foolishness. But if my children one day do backslide, might happen. If they do, Brother A, I want to know that I raised them in the house of God. I'm going to be as kind as I can, but I'm getting right down where the rubber meets the road right now. You're going to love me, you're going to hate me, I don't know. But some people are going to have to pray for mercy. Yes. I don't want to pray for mercy. God is merciful. If I do wrong, my kids can still be saved. I can pray for the mercy of God. But Brother Lee, I plan on by the, by the help of God that when I hit my knees and pray for them, I'm going to be praying for God to be faithful to his word. I'm not going to be saying, Lord, come through for me, even though I didn't do my part. If you got to do that, do it. Yes. But I want to hit my knees and say, Lord, come through for me because I did my part. Every time I pray, I pray for God to put a love for this truth in my children's heart. Every time I pray, I ask God to make their heroes be ministry. But you know what? If I pray that and I don't get myself to the house of God and I don't show up and do what I'm supposed to do, I'm playing games with God. And God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You better plant the right thing if you want to reap the right thing. Don't worry, you don't have to go to church here. You can leave and go somewhere else. You better not misunderstand what faith is. Faith is not foolishness. Faith is not unfaithful. You cannot live any old way you want to. You can't do your body wrong. You can't consume drugs and alcohol and overeat and be gluttonous and do all that stuff and destroy your temple and then come to God and say, oh, God, heal me. No. Now, you can do that and, and cry for his mercy, and God is merciful. God does. But, oh, how much better it would be to know you could come to God when you're sick and say, God, I've done the best I could with this temple. Now heal me. If you will, he will. Faith leads us to do what God said. Go to Galatians chapter 6. I'm not going to get through this lesson today, I don't think. Well, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Don't be misled, my brothers. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. Keep going for me through verse 9. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest the consequences of decay and death. But those who live to please the Spirit of God will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. 
You tired of all the fussing and cussing in your life? Sow something different. So don't get tired of doing what is good. Don't get discouraged and give up, for we will reap a harvest of blessing at the appropriate time. Be not weary in well-doing in due season. You will reap if you faint not. We try to make God a liar when we do what we want to and then come to God and say, now you do what we want to too. That's mocking God. Amen. Faith is entering a school or getting an education necessary and then believing God to open the doors. Faith is showing up taking care of the things of God, taking care of the house of God, taking care of the ministry of God, and then expecting God to do his part. If we don't do our part, we're fooling ourselves if we think God is going to do something. Don't bring your kids to me if you've taught them the house of God is not important. Don't you bring them to me and say, put some oil on their head. I'm going to say, no, 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 no. You've taught them ministry doesn't matter. they seen you opt out. They saw your shallow excuses. All you've got left now is the mercy of God. And I got good news. He's merciful. But oh, how much better it would be to walk in faith and do what God said. See, God tells us what to sow. And then God lets us decide what we're going to sow. We feel, we got to fill our expectations with faith. God said, I know the thoughts I have toward you. Thoughts of good and not of evil. Here's what he said, to give you an expected end. God knows what he wants to do, but then he lays it all at your feet and says, now what are you going to do? Are you going to do what I said? Well, I can't, I can't afford to give to missions, Pastor. Well, you got cable TV and phones. You got electricity, running water. I got to have those. You got to have God. Well, I don't think God will. Yeah, he would too. God will look at everything you give your money to. We'll go get all kinds of bills stacked up by all kinds of stuff. Get ourselves in debt and then say, God, help me. God, help you. You did that. Well, God's good. Lord give it, the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We can trust God with our hearts and our most intimate needs because he loves us. But God is not going to violate his word. God is not an abusive father, nor is he a manipulative uh, charlatan wanting to exploit us at our weaknesses, but he's ready to help us with our weaknesses. And we can certainly respect God because biblical history shows us that God is looking out for our best interest. What God asks us to do is for our good. When God calls us to be holy, that's for our safety. The Lord sets the stage to set the stage to earn Israel's respect in Exodus 19. On Mount Sinai, it was quite a show when the mountain trembled and the lightning flashed. And that took their relationship to the next level. At this stage of development, the Lord had to make an authoritative statement with dramatic demonstrations that caused a fear to come over them, even over Moses. This fear, however, was not a toxic fear, but it was a healthy fear to develop a healthy respect for God. Because if we treat God just any old way, we're in trouble. The, may, the neighbor might skip out on church and not do the things of God, but I'm not going to get away with that. See, I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful I'm hoping and praying I want that more than anything else. I like to think I do. But more than that, I want him to look at my kids. Well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. 
For thou hast been faithful in a few things. God don't ask a lot of us. Your employer asks more of you than God does. And you set your clock to make sure they get it. Y'all set your clock. We're going to start prayer. Six o'clock, Sunday morning, y'all be here. Everybody set your clock. God help us that we don't play games with God and think God's going to play our games. He's not going to do it. God expects respect. And he sets boundaries. He said, Moses, you set boundaries between the secular and the sacred to be established for the protection of the people. Israel was still immature in their revelation and relationship with God. And God gave them boundaries to help them. And God was preparing them for introduction to his covenant. You know where Israel messed up? When they got to looking around, how everybody else does it. I love everybody. But I don't care how Trinitarians do church. Doesn't matter to me. I'm a one God, Jesus name, apostolic Pentecostal. Amen. And I'm Holy Ghost proud of it. Amen. I don't care if they think holiness is old fashioned. Doesn't matter. They can make fun of me. I'm okay with it. If you're easily offended, you're not close enough to God. Laugh all you want. I'll laugh with you because I'm on my way to a city whose builder and maker is God. Yeah. Too many boundaries. I come, out of a, I come out of a church in the same week we had two families leave. One left because the church was too strict. The other left because the church was too, too lenient. You know what? You're either going to live for God or you're not. I find people don't want to live for God. They're going to find somebody else to blame. God gave us a new covenant provided with a close relationship with God. We read about it today on Mount Zion. He said, be careful, though. You're coming to a city whose builder and maker is God with innumerable angels. This new covenant founded in the blood of Jesus provides close relationship with God. God did not stay aloof in the heavenlies and play a game of hide and seek with us. Rather, he came directly to us and revealed himself in the flesh. He bore our sorrows and our grief. He bore our sicknesses and our weaknesses. He came to us. We could not find him. We could not reach him, but he in his love reached to us. How could we not return love for such a God as that? Jesus, unreserved love, made the way for our close relationship with him, making us a royal priesthood. Why is that significant? Royal means top of the line. And priesthood means you got interaction with God. In the Old Testament, only the Levites could have that. But today, through God's word, through the plan of salvation, being repenting, being baptized in his name, being filled with his spirit, we become a royal priesthood. And giving residence to his own spirit in us. God wants to be closer than beside us. He wants to be in us. He is the mediator of the better covenant, which was established on better promises this New Testament. We have so much more than the Old Testament had. Matter of fact, the Old Testament had shadows. Shadows. Man, if I put this chair out here and you could see shadows. Now, if I told you you can't look at the chair, tell me what that shadow is. You'd never know it was a chair. Shadows don't hardly even look like the real thing most times. Shadows are distortions. What the Old Testament had was a distortion. What we have is the real thing. Amen. The law made men high priests of the Levite tribe. 
And they had to offer up sacrifices for their own sins first and then for the people's sins. These men served as an example and a shadow of the heavenly things according to the pattern shown Moses on Mount Sinai. Jesus, however, made one final sacrifice of himself once and for all, not needing to sacrifice first for himself, for he was pure and without sin. He is both the sacrifice and the high priest. He was also the spotless lamb given from the foundation of the world. Everything was looking to Calvary. The Old Testament consisted of outward ordinances requiring perpetual repetition, which only showed one thing. We're sinners, and we need a Savior. You had to keep coming back and reminding that you're sinners, and you need a Savior. But this new covenant is for the remission of sins, to do away with sins. The new covenant changes hearts and minds and writes itself on the tables of people's hearts, giving them a new nature, which is Christ in us. But the problem is we still have the old nature. We got to decide what we're going to do. Follow the spirit or follow the flesh. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, the Bible says. But a sanctified lifestyle should become intuitive to a spirit-led person. To walk after the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, the Bible says. But if you're not walking after the spirit, you're just playing games. You can do church and be so into the flesh. And you can fast till your butt, belly button falls off and pray till you can't cry anymore. But if you're following after the flesh, you're going to reap the flesh. You got to understand, you can play games with a preacher and with everybody around you, but you can't play games with God. He knows what you're sowing. He sees what you're sowing. And you can get mad at God. I prayed. I begged. I pleaded God. And he's in there saying, yeah, but you sowed this. And I'm not mocked. Whatever you sow, you reap. That may hurt your feelings and break your heart, but I got a little good news. Sow something different. Yes. So under righteousness and godliness and holiness. And you'll reap that too. Jesus sacrificed himself to give us this new sanctified lifestyle. The giving of the law on Mount Sinai was so such a dramatic event, visible and audible, and a phenomenal event that scared the people. Faith, however, does not demand this kind of evidence. When we come to Jesus Christ, there's no burning mountains or trembling fire. That's coming in the end. Don't worry. It, it will show up. Amen. This whole thing's going to burn up in the fervent heat before it's over with. But when we come to the Lord, we have to bring ourselves under submission. Without a visible phenomenon. The new covenant involves coming to a mount, the Mount Zion. But one that human eyes have not seen yet. Those who have placed their faith in Jesus have not yet arrived at Mount Zion, but we're going there. We're looking for that city, that heavenly Jerusalem. Go to Hebrews, go to uh, Romans chapter 8, Romans 8 verse 23. Romans chapter 8 verse 23 through 26. And even we Christians, although we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of glo future glory, also grown to be released from the pain and suffering, we too wait anxiously for the day when God will give us full rights as his children, including the new bodies he has promised us, those glorious bodies. Now that we are saved, we eagerly look forward to this freedom. For if you already have something, you don't need to hope for it. Verse 25, but if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidently. Verse 26, finally, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress, for we don't even know what we should pray for or how we should pray, but the Holy Ghost prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. 
We're still looking for something more than what we already have. We're looking for that new Jerusalem. But let us be careful how we walk. That heavenly Mount Zion is referenced several times in our Bible. Speaking of heaven, those who partake of the new covenant presently have access to spiritual privileges, yet we are still looking for that new city. Moses couldn't stop the journey. Notice when Moses began looking for a city, he was still uncircumcised. He's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. God said, go look for it. Okay, God, where is it? Just go that way. All right, let's go. Get Pack the bags, honey. Where are we going? We're going looking for a city. Where is it? God said, go that way. So here he goes, looking for a city out in the desert. Now, where are you going, Moses? We're leaving. Well, Y'all come back? No, we're not coming back. Where are you going? We're looking for a city. Whose city? God's city. God told, yeah, God told me that. Y'all want to go look for it? We ain't doing it. That's stupid, Moses. I mean, Abraham, that's dumb. Here he goes, looking for a city. He gets about halfway there. God says, stop. What now, God? You got to be circumcised. You and all your household and all your slaves and all your servants. I wonder if the servants say, can we vote? Everybody say, in the self-same day. And the self-same day, the day God told Abram that, Abram come in and said, all right, boys, we're having a meeting. Slaves, y'all too, come on in here. Everybody, we're getting circumcised. What? God said we got to. Oh, it gets worse. He keeps looking for a city, and one day God says, all right, now, give me your firstborn son. And the self same day. Abraham didn't say, can we discuss it? Can we vote? He said, whatever you want, I'll do. Why, why would Abraham? Because he believed there was a city out there. Told his wife, saddle the donkey. Get the boy ready. Where are you going? We're going to go sacrifice to the Lord. They got to the mountain. The, the boy said, where's the sacrifice? He said, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. Woo! I don't know who he was with. I think it was Ishmael, in my opinion. But whoever was with the donkeys, he said, you stay here with the donkeys. Me and the lad are going yonder to worship. Amen. God have mercy. <laughs> He's fixing to take his only, his, his oldest son. He's fixing to drive a knife through his chest at the word of God. And he don't even call it sacrifice. And we have trouble doing the little things God asks us to do. Abram's fixing to kill his son. And he says, this is worship. <sighs> he goes up. He pulls that knife back. And God says, now I know that you believe me. God's going to let stuff come in your life to test you. To find out if you really believe this or not. If you're just drugged along by somebody else, you're not going to be drugged much further. There's coming a shaking in this last days that everything that could be shaken will be shaken. If your spouse can drag you out, you're going to be drugged out pretty soon. You better make your calling and your election sure because when the mark of the beast gets here, you're not going to be able to buy, sell, or trade anymore. You're going to have to decide to trust God. Oh, but I got good news. Good news. I've been young and now I'm old, David said, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. I don't know how he's going to do it. Oh, but he's going to take care of his people. Amen. But you better be in the wheelbarrow. You better not be playing games. You better, be, you better not be hollering, I believe, I believe, I believe, but I'm not getting in that wheelbarrow. 
God knows. I'm going to tell you, we can have what we want if we'll give what we're supposed to give. We'll do what we're supposed to do. Some people want a lot of stuff. Here's their idea of getting it, though. Lord, make the pastor do it. No. I'm pretty dumb, but I'm not quite that dumb. God, make the pastor. They won't even pay their tithes. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. He's going to help us. I'm going to preach, and y'all do what you want to with it. The giving of the law on Mount Sinai was dramatic, but now there's no great mountain burning. Now God calls us to submit ourselves and go looking for that city. Thank you, Sister York, whose builder and maker is God without any great fanfare or drama. The benefits of this new covenant. We enjoy a more complete and fulfilling relationship with God as he lives inside of us. The Old Testament didn't have that. And writes his commandments upon our hearts. We are no longer confined to animal sacrifices for temporary forgiveness of sins. The full and final sacrifice of Christ Jesus has given us payment and relationship with God. And we can enjoy a relationship with God based upon love and respect. And your relationship with God is not based on me. You don't need to bring any of your sins to me. But I will tell you this. You better obey those who have the rule over you. For they watch for your soul. In the New Testament covenant, we are privileged to be priests unto God. We're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. But so was Israel. They were peculiar to God. But they fussed and fought with their leadership. They wanted to go back to Egypt. To finally God gave them up. We have a high priest, Jesus Christ. He bears our sins and our iniquities. He's ever with us, always helping us. But he does require of us to be faithful unto him. The priests of the old covenant, including Aaron, the high priest, descended from Levi. Only descendants of that tribe of Levi could fulfill those priestly privileges and experience the fulfillment of ministering in the tabernacle of that day. They were sacrificing, eating showbread, igniting the candle every, every morning and evening and putting on fire on that incense cleaning themselves in the labor of water, engaging in that holy place of worship where the table of showbread was and the candlestick was, the altar of incense was. There they would go and commune with God every morning and every evening. But only the high priest could experience the holy of holies, and that was once a year. But in this new covenant, we've been made kingdom priests unto God, and now we can go into the holy of holies any time we want. But don't ever think that means you can go any way you are. That's why I often say, make sure you go to the prayer room before you come out and worship. Amen. Don't treat God nonchalantly. Amen. Don't get caught up in talking to everybody else or get here too late. You're fixing to worship the God of glory. Hit that prayer room and say, God, if there's anything I know or don't know that ain't right between me and you, forgive me. Because there is a danger in this New Testament. We have more. More is expected of us. There's such a danger, though, of becoming careless, lazy with the things of God. And what happens is, Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. When Ruth, when she left, she left the house of bread because there was no bread. They were in a famine. And she took her family to a foreign land. And in a foreign land, she lost her husband and her two boys. 
And she didn't realize how rich she was until she got back. Because Brother Lee, when she got back, you can read your Bible. She said, I left full, but I came back empty. Don't treat these things of God lightly. Because you might lose your family. Amen. And even worse than that, you might get back. But what if you can't get them to come back? I've seen it happen. I had a man come when I was pastoring in Ashtown. He said, I was raised in a Jesus name church. Now I'm off in a charismatic church who believes Trinity and they have neat songs and neat light shows and they have the best choirs and the best presentations. Who cares what they got? If they're not baptized in Jesus name, I don't want what they got. They can keep it. He said, I want to bring my family back into this. And he brought them one time and I could tell they didn't want anything to do with it. Pretty soon he never came back. He left full, but he came back empty. You might not think you have a whole lot, but in this Jesus name way, you're full. We don't have the basketball court. We don't have the musicians. We don't have a lot of stuff yet. But boy, are we rich. Boy, are we rich. We got a calling to holiness. We got a one God message. We still baptize in Jesus' name. We still talk in tongues when the Holy Ghost comes like they do in your Bible. Rich, rich, rich. God, don't ever let me complain with these riches I have. But there's a verse that says, Woe to those who are at ease. Where? They came to Mount Zion and they got relaxed. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. God, stir us up. Don't let us get ease in Zion. Don't let us fall asleep spiritually on Pentecostal pews. Don't let us lose our love for this truth. Don't let the love of this world, the stuff of this world, the things of this world, the glittering lights of this world, don't let it begin to bade for the love that only belongs to you. We have to choose. We can pursue as close and as intense a relationship with God as we want to. God says, if you will. If I will what, God? If you will submit. God says, if you will be loyal. If you will put me first. If you will give. Oh, yeah, giving too. He said, good measure. Press down. Shaken together. And running over. Boy, if we believe that, our giving would be unbelievable. We sing it. Serving one another. Loving one another. Taking care of one another. Mentoring one another. I got to be at church because I got to check on my brother and I got to check on my sister. And in the word and prayer, we choose what we're going to do on Mount Zion. And God has brought us to this beautiful place. It's not Mount Sinai. It's Mount Zion. But let us be careful how we take care of it. Let's stand.